Shields up, everyone. Be well. Be safe. Each of our podcasts are relevant to our interstellar mission. Most of our podcasts will have complimentary videos. All crewed spacecraft are going to need some form of protection, whether that takes the form of Kevlar wraps, armored hulls, or shields. The faster a ship travels, the more protection it will require. For radiation, protection is a must as well. As we already know, slower speeds do not require much in the way of shielding satellites or rovers or any other small spacecraft. Current satellites tell us this story very well. Faster spacecraft such as the coming SpaceX Starship rocket for the first time in our history will carry humans to Mars. Other than radiation shielding it is likely eventually we're going to need either armored hull or shielding. Faster spacecraft such as the coming SpaceX Starship rocket for the first time in our history will carry humans to Mars. Other than radiation shielding, it is likely eventually we're going to need either armor or debris shielding to protect against things like ball bearing sized debris. So far as we know, no spacecraft has been hit on the way to Mars. Perhaps we've just been lucky. If you think about all the near Earth asteroids that have passed the Earth in the last year, there's been a lot. What we don't know about are all those ball bearing size asteroids because we're unable to detect those. But we do know that the International Space Station is constantly be struck by micrometeorites. There are several types and generations of shielding. For faster spacecraft, shields must be projected far ahead of the craft in order to deflect the debris just a little so that when the ship reaches where the debris is, it has been pushed aside. Any craft traveling at relativistic speeds, should a single kitty litter grain sized particle collide with that ship, this would impart enough energy to the ship to equal a kitty litter sized grain of antimatter. I don't need to say, perhaps I don't need to tell you just how much energy would be released in the collision. It would not be good. Now, fortunately, we are already looking into proper shielding, even some advanced shielding, as you will hear about in just a moment. In this podcast, we will be discussing several aspects of shielding. And with that, enjoy the podcast, EP11. Renee, we have some notes here. What about your two cents worth here? Please. Well... Um, Point defense system is a dynamic shield. Oh, first of all, I want to say this. If you... Mm -hmm. Right now, one of the main defenses, and I should say that, quote, defenses, unquote. Yeah. And I mean no offense of this, is luck. Yeah. In other words, the International Space Station just kind of relies partly on chance that nothing big will hit it. Nothing a little bigger. Nothing too big. A lot of things have hit this International Space Station. I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that it has been hit many a times already. So, yeah, little micrometeorites are hitting it all the time. But I mean, it's just chance unless something big hits it. Bigger. Yeah. Or faster. And while that's worked up until now, when you have routine commercial space flight going back and forth between planets at high speed, that's means speeds much faster than the orbital velocity of the International Space Station. Yes. 
just relying on chance that you're not going to run into something, it, it it's not going to work anymore. Sooner or later, it, you will hit it anyway. Yeah. So, but the problem is, is that armor is heavy, which not only reduces your payload, but it's hard to get off the planet. And even if it's not off planet, it means that you need more propellant to get it moving. Yeah, exactly. Shields, on the other hand, like say, if you could create a sheath of pl relatively dense plasma around or ahead of your ship, then you might be able to, you could at least deflect micrometeorites. Um, and by creating a plasma sheath all around you, you could, NASA's already looking into that to create radiation shielding. Yes. Radiation. It's actually related to like the plasma magnet. Um, that's a topic for a whole nother discussion, but we uh, actually have plans to make a video on the plasma magnet. So you can deflect the radiation this way, you could deflect potentially micrometeorites, and you could, well, at least slightly deflect larger particles, and you couple that with, say, phased laser rays as point defense. That means, yeah, even ordinary commercial spacecraft are going to need point defense. Uh, Elon uh, SpaceX already has plans to put lasers on their starship for that same reason. So, point of fence basically acts as a kind of dynamic shield, where if you have micrometeorites coming in or some other form of debris, you can detect them ahead of time and do you can do a couple different things to it in the case of gas and dust and you have a starship traveling high speed you could emit say using a phased array a phased array antenna you could emit a circularly polarized microwave ahead to create a, basically a cone of microwaves that would push aside or because it's circularly polarized perhaps centrifugally deflect gas and dust particles long before they reach you well ahead of you so that by the time they reach you the slight nudge to the side is enough that they miss entirely mm -hmm. um and you can compare this with lasers where if you have a larger chunk of debris that isn't deflected enough you just use a laser to cause a slight ablation on one side, and that yeah. ablation will knock aside the particle. Right. Which is the best method, yes. And so it's less of, less like science fiction some depicts of just this brute force shield. It's, it kind of is. I mean, plasma shields are basically a kind of regenerative semi-immaterial armor but they're probably going to be a lot cheaper than like if you had some kind of self-healing armor like say with microbots or some kind of material that expands whenever there's a hole made in it that's probably going to require more mass and more material and be more expensive than say just simply a plasma jet and some coil some plasma jets and coils that emit a plasma shield and build a coal a cold a dense cold plasma shield over the vehicle hmm Yes. I mean, those shields are going to be cheaper. It's not just like that in science fiction. It's, that's reality. That's We're, we're going to start using these plasma shields, which means a lot of ships are going to be... You're not, they're going to be just glowing balls of light because they're, when their shields are active. Yes, glowing balls of light. That's. I, I'm sure we're going to get a few people say, yeah, that's what I seen in the sky the other night. Uh, yeah, let's not go there. Uh, do you have something to add in there? Yeah, well, these, this shielding that we see in these games, it comes, that obviously, it's in the games and in sci-fi, because to some degree we already know. We're technologically advanced enough to know that yeah, we're going to need shields, but just exactly when and and how, to what degree and what type of shield, those are things that need to be worked out. We need to enge engineer those. But, um, you mentioned the long range particle deflection. We've talked about this a few times before, 
uh, I think it's a good idea we mention this again. Debris needs to be nudged long, very, very far ahead of the ship. The ship is going to be traveling so fast. Well, that's, that's kind of, I want to, sorry, I want to interject something there. Yeah, yeah go the right The reason ahead. it needs to be deflected so far away, or it doesn't need to be, but if you try to just shove it out of the way, you're going to expend a lot of energy. Exactly. And it's going to be inefficient. Right. Whereas, okay, Robert L. Forward designed something called the Star Wisp. It's a little tiny, like, mm. three gram probe. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, pushed by, like, a 10 gigawatt microwave. Well, and it could accelerate, I think, to 12% speed of light in three days. Yeah. Now imagine what a microwave like that mounted on the front of the ship. Yes, like the navigational deflector dish on the front of the Enterprise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, except actually, it's not going to be a dish. It'll be just a flat rectenna. Yeah. It's not going to look like much. It's just going to be a flat gray plate. <laughs> it's not going to look like a, a satellite dish to receive your latest tv shows <laughs> new it might no. produce a f uh, radiation in that shape but yeah. that it would do that through phased array where now it's one section emits and the next and the next and the next and it produces a slanted or angled beam yeah and using that you can create a cone of microwaves ahead of you at 10 gigawatts and if you circularly polarize it then if it can accelerate a three gram probe to 12 percent speed of light in three days just think about how quickly it could accelerate tiny particles of gas and dust. Yeah. yeah. And here's the thing. Because of the speed of a starship, if you just have a giant electrode on the front, mm. it will... If you imagine the star, you're sitting there at rest, let's say. It's just yeah. relative to Earth, let's just say, far away, though. Yeah. And a starship with its charge goes racing by at 12% speed of light that's going to produce a huge magnetic field because it's a charge that's moving it's yeah and although it's moving a lot slower than current in a wire it's moving way faster than the electrons in the wire actually are which means its effective change in electric field strength is absurd it's a ridiculous magnetic field that it will create yeah massive magnetic field absolutely that will already start to deflect and create a bit of a bow shock ahead as you plow into the interstellar medium mm -hmm. you'll get a shock wave but that will act like a kind of plasma shield as you yeah. plow it and also it will ionize the part the um interstellar medium ahead of you and you can yeah. help it along with say some particle beams and uv lasers to ionize it ahead right then you fire these circular polarized cone of microwave radiation, like say a hundred times the length of your vehicle. If your vehicle's like a kilometer long, you might beam it, yeah, a hundred kilometers away. Yes. And what you might do is a moving focal point. So you focus a microwave burst just like a few hundred meters away, then a few hundred more, and then et cetera, and you race along until it goes a hundred kilometers away and then back. And you do this in rapid succession, so you create a cone of shaped region of intense microwaves, circularly polarized. And that is circularly polarized so that the axis of the microwave's rotation is parallel with the direction of travel. The idea being that if it can maximize the efficiency of it by using that powerful force of the microwave array to deflect particles to the side. Right. And that plus also, and I'll make this last thing, then you can continue. No, 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 you're, you're fine. The plasma shockwave being created by plowing into the interstellar medium mm -hmm. will probably get inflated by the force of the microwaves on it, heating it, and it'll inflate it out into more of a cone shape ahead. Yeah. So end up with a slippery pointed aerodynamic um, cone in front of you, a plasma that will deflect stuff. It, you don't even need to restock it, it will self-reinforce. Kind of in the shape of, of what a spacecraft should be at high high speeds. Except that the spacecraft would be a tiny little thing yeah. inside of a relatively giant shield. <laughs> yes. And the oh, plasma yeah. magnet, what that does is it uses spinning magnet, rotating magnetic fields to create a mm. plasma current, which will centrifugal force pushes it out until it reaches equilibrium. And mm. now you have a giant coil made of plasma surrounding your ship, which... When you look at Earth's magnetic field, it's not very strong, but it's huge, so it's good at deflecting. 
If you have this giant plasma coil made from the interstellar medium you're flying through wrapped around your ship. Right. Even though even if it's not a very strong current, it will produce a, a large magnetic field and have quite a potent deflecting effect. Right. And you know, um if it, can I ask you a question on that? Yeah, you might what? need to come a little closer to your mic. Oh, sorry. A question. Plasma shields. What is that going to do to communications? Before you answer that, I wanted to mention something. Um, you you stated uh, we ionizing the interstellar medium before we mm -hmm. get to it. Um, that the purpose of that is to so that the what otherwise would be neutral particles by ionizing them they'll interact with the magnetic and electric properties of the shield otherwise yeah i forgot to mention that yeah no, no problem to yeah. a lot of people that would be a given but to a lot of other people that they don't know anything about this so yeah it's good yeah. to state that yeah exactly okay and so actually sorry i do want to mention one more thing in that yes while your electric f electrode would do the initial ionization mm -hmm. the as you inflate that plasma sheath using your microwaves yeah um the shockwave would get pushed out and running into that shockwave that's effectively electrostatically charged yes which means that the electrode will just act it acts as um just sort of initially to get it going and maintain some charge but mm -hmm. the extended cone-shaped plasma sheath ahead of you will ionize into some medium once it's established yeah a very strong electric field will impart a charge on the debris as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did you have something more to say on that one? Uh, I, not on that. I have more to say on plasma shields, but you go ahead first. Well, I just uh, wanted to make mention um, the plasma shield. You know, some people are going to ask if it is it hot plasma, is it cold oh. plasma? Actually, that does relate to what I was about to say. Okay, so go right ahead. And and if you would also um, talk a little bit about communication through that plasma. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay. Those plasma shields are going to be dense and cold. Yes. So the difference between hot... It seems an oxymoron because plasma is like it's a fourth state of matter. It requires high temperatures, but mm -hmm. it's not strictly true. You can form it that way, but you can also form it other ways. Yes. A hot plasma, let's see, um, okay, I think it goes like this. Uh -huh. In a plasma, you don't just have one measurement of temperature, you have two things with temperature you have to measure. The ions, that's the atomic nuclei, which is normally, that's where most of the mass is, that also equates to the actual physical temperature of the plasma, like normal materials, it's the nuclei vibrating that yes. creates the heat. But in a plasma, because the electrons are detached from the, they're ionized, they're detached, mm -hmm. you also have a separate electron temperature. Yeah. So you can have a cold plasma where the ions are cold, mm. and therefore it's cold to the touch, but the electrons are very hot. In a plasma screen TV, it uses cold plasma. The electrons are very mm. hot, but the ions are cold. Same thing in a fluorescent light bulb. Right. Good point. Or a plasma lamp. And I, I don't just mean those plasma globes, I mean like a sulfur plasma lamp or other similar ones. Yes. Illuminating parking lots. Things mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Um, or sulfur uh, lamps too. Uh, not sulfur, uh, sodium lamps. Sodium, yes. So, uh, what was I going to say there? <laughs> oh, there's that student team several years back now. It oh, showed yeah. with just a four Tesla magnetic field, which is just what an, you get out of an MRI, and uh, mm -hmm. Tokamax produced 14 Tesla easily. Mm -hmm. A four Tesla field could hold in place, they showed, a cold plasma, and the key thing is it has to be cold, not hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A cold plasma dense enough to not absorb but reflect visible light. You could create a plasma mirror. Like, it, it seems very sci fi, but they showed that that's entirely doable. That's that's neat. That's really neat. Now as for how you'd hold that around, that, that goes into field geometry. 
Mm. Um, Jean-Pierre Petit, um, who I think we mentioned in our EFE Torrencraft video, but I'm not sure. Yes, we did. He shows a particular field geometry for a magnetohydrodynamic aircraft. The same sort of thing could be used. Basically, he, he shows, I won't go into details here, but he talks about how you can create, do apparently the reverse and get plasma to attract to the magnet rather than pushed away. Mm -hmm. With a dynamic AC field, not just a yeah. DC one. It it has to be basically creating null zones where the magnetic field cancels itself and the plasma goes there. Yeah, that's really that's, the key. Yeah, that's a whole nother ball of wax to get into. Mm -hmm. That's for the video. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can hold a dense sheath of cold plasma that will act as basically immaterial armor. It'll mm -hmm. reflect radiation up to some frequency mm -hmm. and it will also being cold plasma it'll, it'll act as armor things will hit it and the plasma will resist via the magnetic field bound up in it it'll be compressed and it will plasma will resist the impact if you can make it dense enough mm -hmm. plus in the case of particles coming in well, the particle beams are a, well effectively a starship is like flying into a continuous particle beam for years <laughs> Yeah. Good well, <laughs> the plasma, if it's at least as dense as Earth's atmosphere, can, and the, whereas the team, the student team, their their plasma that they propose is denser than Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Um, but even a low density one will ionize. I act like a foil, um, stripper. It's an electron stripper. It's mm -hmm. so that as the particles, neutral ions, pass into it. The electrons are stripped from them and they become ionized and therefore the magnetic field can deflect them. Mm. So, yeah, we're going to have plasma shields, like Star Trek, and it, they will weaken under bombardment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, before I get to that, to answer the other thing, the communication, that, that is going to be difficult because as right now with reentry, radio waves aren't going to go through. Yeah. Nor will terahertz or IR or visible. Yes, right. You might have to use UV lasers to communicate with a shielded ship. Oh, and that's providing its plasma is not too dense. Mm hmm. And reflect back in, is what you're saying. Or reflect any incoming communication away. Is it. Is the back half of the craft going to be shielded? With a starship, still, yeah, because yeah. Um, not as much, though. So the plasma might be thinner there, less dense, because it still needs to protect from radiation, just ambient radiation, but not the same violent stream of particles. So you I'm might sure be able to get UV mm -hmm. lasers through the back yeah. part of the shield. Of course, if the ship's coming to the system, then you're out of luck there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which means yeah. either you're not going to be able to communicate with them, or, I mean, it, it, you might be able to use what we talk, what I talk, the same thing they talk about in the Singularity video and the and what, in the future Tachyon. Right. And the Singularity video, by the way, it's just a few days out. Yes. Uh, the null waves. The yes. EM null radiation. You Put could you use that. Go. You might be able to use that because <laughs> less. It's kind of like half dark. It's like a kind of dark light. For communication, it can pass, right? Yeah, it can pass through things. It's also worth mentioning that that's potentially of use for uh, power transmission from space without the same problems as microwaves. Yes, without heating the atmosphere. But that's another. That's another. Yeah, another, another topic. topic. Yeah, we have a lot. So I guess <laughs> that's all you could do is the no mm -hmm. waves, the EM no waves. Yeah. So. Tell tell me about the different types of shielding. I mean, let's let's talk about the different types and the plasma shields that we're discussing right now are Gen One shields. Technically, yeah, yeah. Because you can consider a Generation Two shield is a shield that no longer has any particles of matter in it and is just based on energy fields only, like electric, magnetic, EM null, etc. It, and though, you, like I know, it's mm -hmm. a pure energy shield, wouldn't yeah. be subject to weakening. Whereas plasma, you can knock the plasma will get knocked away, and of course, as we just talked about, like a starship traveling through space, 
Yeah. The interstellar medium it's plowing through will reinforce the shield. Yes. Right. But if anything big hits it, like it plows into a dense plasma shield, it'll knock plasma away. Of course, yeah. a point defense, the expanse showed this, where their point defense created an invisible shield around the ship, mm. where anything coming into that would be just shredded or mm. knocked away. Right. An expanse save it where it only plays in missiles and craft, but in real life it applied to railgun rounds too, or micrometeorites, because you'd use phase laser arrays. And that'd be right. a kind of, it wouldn't be an always on shield, it'd be a dynamic shield, where your shield, quote unquote, is yeah. basically a sensor, uh, uh, what you have, it would be an invisible boundary mm -hmm. around the ship where the sensors can detect things. And another bound, uh, zone where anything coming into the first zone can be deflected before it reaches the second zone. So you have an invisible barrier around where anything coming in too fast or can be zapped with the lasers and knocked aside. Yeah. Or ionized and then magnetically deflected. So it's not a matter of um, Sulu shields up. No, it's your shields are always on. Always on, yeah. Now, if you expected to be shot at by someone, then you would perhaps increase the density of the shields, blocking out communication and limiting your own sensors, but... I have to say that on the Enterprise, isn't the um, deflection array down below, isn't that always on? Yep. Okay. There's one episode of uh, Star Trek The Next Generation yeah. where some primitive species was attacking uh, the Enterprise, and... The crew, Picard and Riker just looked at each other and it's like, they're using old fashioned lasers on us. It's like they said it couldn't even get through the navigational deflectors. It's like, they don't even yeah. need to raise shields. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some degree of truth to that, I'm sure. <laughs> you, so, Gay? Oh yeah, sir. Well, just a quick question before you change that. You mentioned that it would split the, that it would knock the electrons off. Mm -hmm. um, those electrons, some of those do get added to the shield, don't they? Yes and no, but the ions that are deflected will. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, if you if you're running into the interstellar medium, you're ionizing it. It's yeah. piling up in a bit of a, a sheath. Then yeah. you have a re self reinforcing shield. The um, and you mentioned it in your as you were talking plasma shields and this is a head slapper of course plasma shields are made of particles this is why they're ablative well they're not okay this actually goes in there's five primary properties that i can think of for any armor or shield mm -hmm. the first property is energy deflection yes that's a fraction of incident energy Oh, like photon energy or kinetic energy that is deflected without being absorbed or tran nor transmitted. Right. The second property is energy absorption. That's a fracture incident energy that is absorbed but not transmitted or deflected. That's like how much energy, what fraction of the inc incident energy ends up going into the shield or armor. And the uh, third criteria, or property I mean, is uh, energy transmission. That's a fraction of instant energy that is transmitted through the armor shield and therefore reaches the vehicle's hull. Ooh, yeah. That's that's the part you want to minimize how much energy is transmitted, because that means that's not protection. Right. The fourth property is integrity. Not in a sci-fi term, but that's a measure a kind of measure of the intactness of the armor shield. Yes. Holes in the armor are thin shields. Those all, etc. Those all decrease the effective integrity, the protective quality of the armor or shield. Like if you have a piece of armor and there's a hole in it, if something else hit in or near that hole, then it's not going to do as much protection than if it yep. didn't have the hole. Exactly. Um, and the fifth factor, uh, fifth mm -hmm. property is a scaling factor. Basically, these mm -hmm. are factors that describe the ratio between the energy deflection, absorption, and transmission rates. Mm -hmm. relative to the integrity of the armor shield. Mm. That is, the rate at which the protectiveness of the armor shield decreases as it's damaged. Right. So, for example, if you had a 10 gigawatt, like just, just a, a simplified example to make the point. Mm -hmm. 
If you have a 10 gigawatt la laser cannon firing on a shield, let's say the shield deflected 70% of the radiation that hit it, absorbed 2.9%, uh, mm -hmm. um, and transmitted 1%. Yes. In that case, of the 10 gigawatts hitting it, 7 gigawatts would be harmlessly deflected without being absorbed or transmitted. Mm -hmm. um, 2.9 gigawatts, that's a lot, would be mm -hmm. absorbed into the plasma shield, probably causing ablation. Mm. Yeah, expansion and, and ablation, yeah. 0.1% one, uh, of the gig of 1 gigawatt. Yes. Um, that. Um, hold on, I... Let's see. I need to make sure I'm doing this correctly. Okay. So Unscripted 700... podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so 7 gigawatts would be deflected. Mm-hmm. Um, 2.9 gigawatts would be absorbed, and A hundred megawatts would be. Sorry, I had to do some math here. So, okay, seven gigawatts would be deflected, two point nine gigawatts would be absorbed, causing ablation, and a hundred megawatts would make it through to heat the hole underneath. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, but you might be able to deal with that. Yeah. You want to try and maximize deflection. Uh, you want to minimize transmission. It'd be better to absorb and then cause ablation of the shield and therefore protect it, then let it through. Because mm. although you lose shield there, it's plasma, it can regenerate. If it hits right. a hole and melts it through, then, mm, or if it, like, high streams, high speed stream of particles, their starship, and if it cooks the interior, then mm, it's bad. You'd rather yeah. lose shield than have it cook the interior. Yes. But one way you can improve it, if you could layer it. So say, let's say you have another plasma shield underneath the first one, with mm -hmm. the same properties. But yeah. now only you start with 100 megawatts. That's it. So that means of that, 70 megawatts is harmlessly deflected. Uh, 29 megawatts is absorbed, which might not ablate the plasma shield. It might just heat it, and mm -hmm. then it'd have to boil off and cool down again. And then only... And then only one megawatt would then actually hit the hole. So mm -hmm. you've cut, you've taken the same amount of energy, and you by putting just two shields of the same properties, right? You've cut it down to only one megawatt hitting the hole. And you could put a Which, third shield and cut that down even further. Yeah. Which is not bad at all. So like with a third shield, that'd be a thousand megawatt. Okay, that'd be one megawatt, one thousand kilowatts. Um. 700 kilowatts would be deflected, uh, 290 absorbed, which might not do anything to the shield, and only 10 kilowatts would actually hit the hole. That's uh, potentially manageable. Yeah, not, so much, just, not much at all. So with just three shield layers like that, you take mm -hmm. the 10 gigawatts and cut it down to only, well, a lot of it's being deflected and only 10 kilowatts make it to the hole. Yeah. So you have these powerful particles, well, this uh, basically particle in coming at you when you're traveling at high fraction of speed of light. Yeah. Only a small fraction then would get through to the hole. It really is a lot like someone shooting a particle beam at you. Yeah, like if you're it, traveling 70% mm -hmm. speed of light, it's like a combat grade particle beam. Yeah. And the grain of kitty litter, like you mentioned in the beginning, mm -hmm. at 70% speed of light, the kinetic energy of the kitty litter grain would mm. equal its mass energy. So it's as if it's a piece of antimatter. Yeah. And it would hit you with the force of an atomic bomb going off. And yeah. you don't want that to hit. So that one you want to either ionize and get the magnetic field to deflect it 
a little tiny bit so that it misses. Yes. Uh, Cause that's the thing, you don't need to shove it completely to the side or push it forward. You just need to knock it aside a little bit so that its uh, trajectory is no longer straight, but angled. So that it misses you. Whoa. Ah. Yeah. Cause that's the point. If you deflect it long away, you can get a, just a tiny nudge, thoop, it misses. Right. And if it still is like a little too close, you can just ablate a tiny part of it, just a little bit. It wouldn't take much and just knock it aside. Bing! Yeah. And th 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 the dust and gas just whizzes by you harmlessly. Yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful... It, that Whether we have more advanced shields or not, that's still going to be the default method. Is just a de deflect them slightly. Oh, you're always going to need that, yeah. You now, mentioned... Mm -hmm. Okay, real quick. Um, you mentioned the kitty litter. Um, and I just wanted to refocus on that a second. A granted kitty litter tra traveling at 70% the speed of light. <clears throat> its mass will act as though on the ship, as though it was a antimatter kitty litter grain yeah in other words it it's kinetic energy yeah will equal its rest mass energy it's rest which energy is, which is tremendous yeah um and then he, by the way that i want to just uh -huh. say a shout out here yes that a little analogy was from uh winchell chung's uh website atomic rockets oh atomic rockets you guys wonderful check site. that out yes oh, wonderful yeah. site Unfortunately, Winchell right now is suffering with, uh, uh, what was it? Cancer. Prostate, prostate cancer. Hopefully yes. he'll recover and wish him well. Let's let's all wish him well and wish for him a speedy recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, Winchell Chung of Atomic Rockets website. That's AtomicRockets.com. Is, doesn't he go by another? Actually, uh, it's not. It's not quite the address. It's uh, okay. projectrow.com slash. Right. Um, here we can we'll just put, put it the on link screen. On, on screen and also in the video description. Yeah, excellent. Um, so before we get away. Oh, from... that's right. He he also goes oh. by the handle uh, Nyrath or Nyrath the Wise. Yeah. It's an old handle from uh, earlier days. Nice All guy. Right. Okay, yeah. so before we get away from you were talking about the shields there. Mm -hmm. Part of the shields, a, an aspect of the shielding is heat management. Oof, yeah. Yeah, big deal. <laughs> Very big deal. Because you, you might... Okay, so you deflect the radiation or, or absorb it into like um, radiation shielding on the front of your ship. And yeah. then it slowly cooks the ship. Yeah, that's right. It the if we don't deal with that heat, then the heat slowly migrates from the nose steadily toward the the radiation is actually almost the bigger one because mm -hmm. yes. For example, if you have a uh, thirty centimeters, and for you mm -hmm. using the imperial system, that's a foot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Thirty cent. 30 yeah. centimeters of layered foil and metal and plastic metal foil and plastic shielding mm -hmm. should cut the radiation of going from 30 percent speed of light and this is on an old uh, centauri dreams uh, blog post mm. um put a link to this that in the video description as well mm -hmm. um it was thir so 30 centimeters of shielding will cut the radiation from going 30% speed of light down to a roughly equivalent to the radiation ex experience aboard the International Space Station. So that sounds mm -hmm. pretty good, but until you consider NASA's <clears throat> done some studies yeah. over the past several years, the radiation levels in the International Space Station seem to be already enough that it start it causes brain swelling and then brain yeah. st starts causing neuron death. Yeah, that's terrible. And which can lead to Alzheimer's symptoms. Um, mm. How prevalent that is in astronauts has already been up there. It's still unknown. It, but that's uh, kind of sad that yeah. a lot of the astronauts who are okay right now may 
in just like five, ten years, start developing Alzheimer's like symptoms. Yeah. Of course, it depends on the person, but NASA study seems to indicate that that would be the case. It might be bad enough that a six month trip to Mars may leave the person, because uh, the radiation's higher out there, it might leave the person already beginning to lose mental faculties, which is bad. Well, the heating of the brain causes an expansion of the brain and we are it's not know. just heating it's it's also an inflammatory reaction yes exactly. it's actually it's more inflammatory reaction because basically it's yeah. like a foreign particles mm -hmm. it's like taking random bits of dust and just embedding in your brain randomly because yeah. you have tiny little particle like helium or nuclear protons just flying the brain then getting stuck inside and the brain's just like Wah! what the heck is this and it, it reacts and inflames right foreign matter absolutely just basically a teleporting into the brain okay so did did you wanted to move on to the next bit uh, yeah well i think this would be the last subject to cover unless you have more to say after which you might yeah i might yeah oh eh. i can't it's just me at it me again oh she, she she wants to talk about shielding as well apparently so Cancel um, shielding. <laughs> so, now a more perfect, like more ultimate form of shielding would be mm -hmm. there's a thing called a polarton. Mm -hmm. Now, what that is, it's a photon coupling to an electric dipole. Like, say, in a material, that means it'd be coupling, coupling to electric charges within a material. Mm -hmm. You can create, and now if you have a superconductive resonator, you can create what's called a polarton superfluid, where the photons are stuck inside and interacting with electric charges, electric dipoles in the superconducting layers. Yeah. And you can charge it with light so that you have basically a kind of photon wall. Yes, it'd be glowing due to leaking radiation. Mm -hmm. And any photons hitting it, these polarons have a special property. They can, mm -hmm. they're photons or photon quasi particles that can deflect other photons because they're coupled with a dipole. They're able to interact, right. Yeah. Now, that's very similar to how the dense plasma can create, or not very similar, it's kind of equivalent to how the pl dense plasma can reflect aim radiation. Mm -hmm. And it can do so where even if a little bit is absorbed, the plasma getting heated will just knock off and the rest will cool down, whereas armor would damage it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can do even better though, if you could use these polar atoms. Because then you'd have the surface, this polarton superfluid surface, this photon mm -hmm. wall, where any mm -hmm. light hitting it would deflect. Mm -hmm. Same should go for any EM waves impinging on it, and even charged particles should get deflected that way. Mm -hmm. But to deflect stuff at a long range, that's not enough. That's just the surface. You might be able to use that to protect vehicles from like lasers or from intense solar radiation. Yeah. But to deflect particles and other things you need longer ranged so mm -hmm. and we've touched on this um before but and i will touch i touch on this in the singularity converter video i think we and, need to repeat it all the time and i will talk about it in more much more detail more than we ever had before in mm -hmm. the tachyon video mm -hmm. but that is these null you know, electromagnetic null fields and null radiation mm -hmm. they're able to interact with the quantum vacuum to a much stronger degree Strong enough that if you have, like, say, petawatt power levels, which you can do by compressing light pulse, mm -hmm. um, I recommend looking at uh, pulse chirping. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then if it's also, like, say, UV frequencies, basically we can just now make these. If it's this specially conditioned and it meet, matches those criteria, very short, very intense, very uh, high, fr uh, relatively high frequency pulse. Mm. Same thing yes. if you can do it with a field, but regardless, right. it'll start to interact with the quantum vacuum, including the um, strong force and weak force quantum vacuum. And these then would be could become free space polarton so you'd have a free space polarton superfluid and this mm -hmm. isn't fiction this is reality this is fact this it still needs some work to 
fully to confirm it, but the mathematics yeah. so far hold held up, and some preliminary experiments show that the mathematical basis is legitimate and sound. Right. It's just now a matter if we can build a device to test this. Right. It's kind of like we have the theory of the steam engine, we need to build a steam engine now. <laughs> But we've made some mock-ups that, but people have made mock-ups, scientists have made mock-ups that show that, yeah, okay, our theory of the steam engine looks like it should work. Now we're just going to build the steam engine itself. Right. So these specially conditioned photons can become free space polartons. So we have a free space polartron superfluid extending out for perhaps hundreds of meters or farther that of photons flying out that can deflect other photons. Right. Now, of course, you'd have to emit them with as much intensity as is impinging on the ship, but... Right. Well, kind of. They can pick up energy if you want to vacuum. Yeah. That's another matter, though. But this way, you can create a photon shield. A shield made of just light that can deflect other photons, electromagnetic fields, and charge even particles, like even neutrons, because they contain quarks inside that have electric fields. Mm -hmm. Anything electromagnetically active should be able to be deflected by this. And because the photons have no mass and aren't directly touching back to the ship, anything that hits the shield will be deflected without any force being put back on the ship. Right. And the, uh, furthermore, you can take this far enough where it's, it's tapping vacuum energy enough, you start getting a negative energy zone um, around the ship, and you have a kind of warp field. They, and now you're starting to become more isolated from the surroundings, like you're in your own pocket universe. And that's the ultimate shield. Yes, it is. And the best thing is that these special condition photons would also condition and modify space time as they move through it. So that any other light passing through it would also become conditioned. So think about this. Yeah. Photons getting would, uh, from outside would get deflected. They'd be now deflected back out and are mm -hmm. going away from the ship and then become conditioned. Which means anything impinging on the shield would only reinforce it further. Yes. That's the way to protect the ship so it's completely invulnerable to its surroundings. It's and a... to travel at 99% speed of light without any harm. And what gen is this shield? I'd call that a Generation 3 shield. Yeah. That's broadly speaking, like you have Type 1, Type 2, Type 3 shields. Like These are not shield. We're not. This is a shield that won't uh, go down. Like in Star Trek, um, they're in the 23rd century. Shields are down to 70%, down to no. 25%. No. no. These shields won't, won't well, do that. In fact, these shields will self-reinforce. Earlier shields, right. shields that are just made of energy alone and no plasma, mm -hmm. those won't weaken either. It's only the first kind of shields made of thick plasma that has very low, like they... Because mm -hmm. even a plasma shield, those remember those properties, deflection, yeah. absorption, transmission. Right. Early plasma shields would rely mostly on absorption and then ablation to protect the vehicle underneath. Mm -hmm. But a more advanced plasma shield would be held tighter and denser and would rely more on deflecting the energy without absorbing it. That way the plasma, right. although it's being hit with a lot of energy, it's playing to speak. Even Look at the uh, Starship. like. Yeah. You can create a plasma sheath ahead where the interstellar medium you're running into reinforces mm -hmm. it. So yes. already there, it's not weakening under bombardment. It's staying the same or even strengthening. Yeah. That's the reality of a shield. There's still limitations to plasma shields. Of this course, is why it, with the Politon is a better shield. But it's more of a gradual process. The plasma yes. would get denser, but also exactly. the total amount of plasma being used would be reduced. So you'd have a, a lower and lower mass plasma shield um, that's denser and denser with more and more energy field playing role until eventually you do it with plasma entirely. And can I say something a little more here? Oh uh, yeah, that I was done. That's okay. That covers more, all my bullet list. And I wanted to um, let it, let our viewers know that the, what we're discussing here, it's based on varying degrees of evidence. So if you want to learn more about this, do the research, find out for yourself. And these polarotons, they're, they're photons with properties that allow them to deflect other photons. 
So this amount of work, the things we're discussing, it's not well known to some. Well, they know it, they know it fairly well, but it's not really well known among the general public or even among the universities. So you can do the research, but could you explain to them you're talking in terms of superfluid? I think um, maybe that needs a little explanation. Well, it's, a, it's not a normal superfluid. It's a polaroton superfluid. What makes it a superfluid? Um, okay, uh, I got to refresh on it real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We may, we may store a lot in our heads, but uh, we, we um, not that much. <laughs> well, basically, in a polaroton superfluid, because the photons mm -hmm. are now a quasi particle called a polaroton, right. that are more interactive, um, you can create a system where they actually move around and act as if they're well a superfluid. In other words, there's no, there's less resistance. It's a superfluid made of light. Does that mean that the photons are going to travel at a different speed than they normally would? Not necessarily. It means that okay. there's no resistance. So in other words, things would be, for example, deflected without any feedback. Um, yes. It's kind of like if you coated a vehicle in a superfluid coating and dropped into water, it would shoot down to the bottom of the ocean as if there's no water there. Like that slippery um, coating that they... Yeah, slips, yeah. I think they called it. Yes, that's an right. acronym. Slips, yeah. It was an acronym, so S L I P S. It's an acronym. So the polytron superfluid also it's stable in principle at much higher temperatures. I'm um, re reading Wikipedia here. There's um, mm -hmm. a link to uh, a paper by um, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna okay. We can put these two links um, in the video. Basically. Mm -hmm. Um, they might soon be able to do a polyton superfluid at room temperature. And of course, superconductors are mm -hmm. getting better and better. They're very close to be able to make a room temperature superconductor. Oh, yeah. Never mind ultra dense hydrogen and deuterium, which are superconductive, but that's another video we need to talk about. Yes. Because there, it's, it's not fiction. It, and it, it, there is legitimate science in it, but that needs a whole video to explain the science behind ultrons, hydrogen, deuterium, and yeah. why it's real and legitimate, no kind of fraud. They're they're valid. Both are valid. But that's another topic. Yes. The point is that, yeah, we'll be able to make a polytron superfluid surface in the very near future here. Making one in free space is a bit harder, but that will be able to be done eventually as well. Yeah. So, I think that's about the best I can do to explain it. Yeah, no, I think that's good. I this is a, a um, the podcast is only meant to give a taste, isn't it? Really, um, a video which will well, eventually or come talk about. about things that maybe don't make good videos, normal videos. Uh, yes, that's true too. I think both are valid. Yeah. When we have a bunch of little subjects that are interrelated, we can kind of freeform a discussion about it. Yeah. When it might be hard to make that into a video, a proper, a conventional video. Yeah, that's right. And there's a lot of topics. I'd say, yeah, another another Shields video definitely kind of in the war. De de definitely. Blah. And we talk about all kinds of things and we have over the years. We didn't think to record our conversations. And so this is kind of along those lines. But during our conversation, there's a lot of... Well, we can't record the conversations because they go on sometimes for hours. And you, do you guys know the kind of editing that has to be done <laughs> to edit out maybe the cat scratching at the furniture or... Uh, you've got to run off to the uh, powder you nose. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think we've covered this this topic pretty good. Um, the of course we didn't mention armored hulls, 
Uh, that is considered a form of shielding, but I think that's armor, not. Now, the the bleed over is with plasma early plasma shields because they're basically kind of energy armor. Yes. Yes, in Star Trek, they what did they do? They plated. Did they entered? They had a what pol they, they had a polarized hole plating in the Enterprise with Archer. Polarized. Okay. I so guess the idea, what that was mm -hmm. the idea was that they electromagnetically reinforced the armor. So that basically they use electromagnetic fields to pump an extra energy to make the armor arbitrarily hard. To densify it. Or just to make it so that mm -hmm. like a, normally like kind of a laser or a particle or a micrometer hit it and yeah. it knock off a chunk. But instead the electromagnetic fields hold it back anyway. Yeah. I think that, that more realistically mm. I think you just use a plasma shield. Like in order yeah. to use plasma just off the surface it wouldn't extend well away from the vehicle at first it'd be just right. like a glowing coating over the ship that would be dense and just because it's plasma you can hold it back as strong as you want well if anyone does a search on youtube for a demonstration of plasma i think most people have seen some form of demonstration that's about as close as what we're referring to um you know, but I do want to say one thing about the Star Trek hull plating. They're putting a lot of energy through the plates, which is going to create heat. Even if it's super conductive, there's a lot of engineering. Well, we could, I suppose we could assume that everything is super conductive from the source of energy all the way to the hull plating. What do you think? Um, well, the hole plating on, on the Enterprise, as mm -hmm. an example. There, how are they energizing it? Well, if I remember correctly, they're supposed to be using electromagnetic fields to just hold the armor in place where but you know, it's rather than relying uh -huh. on the material's right. own properties, they can just right. pump arbitrarily large amounts of energy into coils and just hold it there into coils though they have to get the energy to the coils yeah and they then probably those... have superconductive and actually on that right yeah plasma conduits actually make a certain bit of sense even in real life that make good sense the reason why is because uh, it's possible you might be able to create a resonant um plasma structure that becomes superconductive mm -hmm. and also if you have huge amounts of current Magnet, uh, magnetic fields tend to disrupt um, superconductors. Yes, that's right. So, As does heat. Yeah. Um, they tend to disrupt it. So if you have huge amounts, of, yeah, heat too. Sorry, I forgot about that. So if huge amounts of current where it starts to disrupt it, lose its superconductivity. You mm -hmm. might just say, well, we're not going to get maximum current efficiency anyway be right. because we can't use a superconductor. So you have instead a plasma conduit and you just pump the current through that and the plasma will not lose connectivity as it gets hot. Yeah, right. Also, there's a study here that was related to ball lightning as one possible uh, explanation, although it seems mm -hmm. the um, electrothermal burning of silicon droplets might be the actual answer. Yeah, That's another like topic. It. More likely. Yeah, another topic. Um, but there's one study here that says that... Um, it says here, it was suggested that bound states of radially oscillating charged particles mm -hmm. with opposite oriented, or oppositely oriented spins, yes. the, an, the analog of Cooper pairs, like in a superconductor, yes. can appear inside ball lightning, and therefore it can become mm. superconductive. Interesting. Yeah. So you could have superconduct. Now, if you you can imagine then doing that in say, um, a conduit full of plasma and get a superconductive plasma conduit. Yes. Um, and that can be used to transmit much larger amounts of energy that a conventional superconducting cable even couldn't handle. And what I was saying is that in order to in order to plate the holes, that means that because if you think of the surface area of the enterprise, it's massive. 
Mm. It's a, the disc, uh, the nacelles. Yeah, that's them. a lot of mass. If you have to put conventional armor, that's a hell of a lot of mass for any kind of large space vehicle. If you take, if you if you just take one plate. Now this is a thought experiment here, a thought exercise. If you just take one plate, how much energy is being dumped into one plate in order for something like this to work? It's well, going to be a lot of ener a lot of energy. I honestly don't think that that idea is going to work. No. I think more realistic is that you polarize whole plating and that you have whole plating made of coils that when polarized rather just activated electrify like you know turned right. on right uh that when activated would hold dense plasma like that's just plasma shields early plasma shields early yeah but you wouldn't necessarily do that with every plate because now you're thinking in turn now they that idea would be using a lot more ven energy it would be less efficient no you you'd still it'd be just like an mht aircraft you would hold um you just have coils all over the ship in various places compared to the energies like you might have in a warp mm -hmm. drive or yeah. fusion drive or whatnot we're I talking about the, the energy small required, amount <laughs> yeah the energy required to actually hold the plasma cold dense plasma in place i don't think it's that much yeah on that note, the video is running over an hour now. I think we might want to. No, it's it's not. Oh, Remember this. This is a bit that we're going to have to cut out. So, okay, but on right, that so... note, I th I do think that we should conclude it. Yeah, I think we've covered the topic fairly well. I think we have too. I think as for a podcast, I think we've covered it fairly well. And on that note, we would like to say thank you for listening and keep wondering about space. See you next time.